Now for the first time on TV, the stories and reports of the people who fly and the aircraft they fly. And you are invited in an exciting, pulse-pumping new television series designed for everyone who has ever gazed skywards and dreamt of slipping the bonds of Earth. The Aviators. Today on The Aviators, we take a look at the future of air transportation with the Airbus A380. We peek inside a Cessna 206 during an annual inspection. We're back in the simulator to see what happens when a private pilot takes control of an airliner. And we get a ride inside the cockpit of the L-29 Delta. From the Boundary Bay Airport, this is The Aviators. With its maiden flight in 2005, the Airbus A380 ushered in a new era of passenger aircraft. This airplane is huge. Nicknamed the Super Jumbo, it's 238 feet long and eight stories high, making the A380 the largest passenger aircraft in the world. The aviator Sarah Rapenda caught up with A380 test pilot Terry Lutz at AirVenture. Now, you know, I look at this airplane and wow, it is huge. Does every airport in the world have the ability to carry an aircraft of this size? Actually, most airports around the world can accommodate an airplane the size of the A380. When we began the design process for this airplane, we knew that we had to design it so that it had a significantly slower approach speed and a significantly slower takeoff speed so that it could be use all the existing runways. In fact, compatibility with current airports was one of the main concerns governing the development of the A380. Not only is the runway length requirement for the A380 relatively low, the aircraft is also certified to be able to operate on runways as narrow as 150 feet in width. Every single landing was recorded and the displacement from the center line was recorded and we were able to show statistically that this airplane has no problem landing on a 150 foot wide runway. The real, the real problem that you have is, do you have the, uh, the open space available to taxi to your gates, and then do you have the, the lateral gate space that you need from wingtip to wingtip with other aircraft? The, the wingspan of the A380 is 80 meters. In fact, that's how the A380 uh, got its designation. Okay. If you're anything bigger than that, then uh, they would not be able to operate without special consideration. So it's literally the biggest it can get. The biggest airplane that will fit in the 80 meter box. Airbus is an aviation juggernaut. Originally made up of a consortium of five European companies, Airbus delivered 498 aircraft in 2009, making it the number one manufacturer of passenger airliners in the world. Despite these European routes, the A380's Engine Alliance engines are made in the United States. So tell me a little bit about these engines. Well, these, uh, the engines on this particular airplane were built by Engine Alliance, which is a consortium between General Electric and Pratt & Whitney, both U.S. companies, okay. a large amount of U.S. content in this particular airplane. These engines produce 70,000 pounds of thrust each. That's per engine. Per engine, wow. so 280,000 pounds of thrust for the, whole en for the whole airplane. That's incredible. And, it, and it's one of the things that gives the airplane such great climb performance and such great cruise performance. Terry gave us an opportunity to have a unique look at the A380's entirely fly-by-wire cockpit. I'm looking at this cockpit and honestly it looks nothing like my Cessna 172. Could you explain a little bit the layout? Yeah, this is a fly-by-wire airplane. So with fly-by-wire technology, we're able to fly the airplane with, with a very small side stick controller. So all the pilot inputs are made right here on the side stick controller. These are the thrust levers. Okay. Thrust levers are, can be used just like the single one in your Cessna, except that when, when we fly the airplane, we use the auto thrust almost exclusively. Okay. And the way we get the auto thrust to arm on takeoff is we move the thrust levers up to takeoff position, and then we bring them back to the climb detent, which arms the auto thrust. Okay. And then all of the speed changes and all the altitude changes that we need to do, we do here on the FCU panel, which is our flight control unit. Okay. Another thing to notice on the thrust levers is, is that here are your reverse controls, and you'll notice that only the two inboard engines have reverse on the Airbus A380. And why is that? Well, it's mainly because the outboard engines, in fact, even on a 150 foot wide runway are actually right on the edge. Okay. So we only reverse the engines that are right over the runway itself. Wow. And for all of the other systems on the airplane, we use the controls on the overhead panel. For example, here are all of your uh, air handling systems. 
the electrical system, fuel system, hydraulics, and uh, fire and uh, warning systems. Now, what we, uh, if we have any uh, systems problems, it will be displayed on the lower uh, ECAM, Electronic Centralized uh, Avionics Monitoring, or Aircraft Monitoring. And uh, we'll get a message here, and it will begin with the name of the system. And you go right up here, up the side to the name of the system that you want, and then begin reconfiguring as appropriate. While a lot of the systems on the A380 are largely automated, the core flight systems are still very familiar to any pilot experienced on smaller jetliners in the Airbus fleet. In fact, Terry even finds similarities flying the A380 and his personal aircraft, a Vans RV-8. What I like about both airplanes is, is that once you're off the ground, you have a very light, nimble feel on the control stick. Both airplanes respond with very little control motion, and they do exactly what I want them to do with, without any, any compensation to get there. And I think that's the most impressive part. The A380, one of the differences, and actually makes this airplane better, is that it auto-trims, so I never have to constantly be bumping on my, my trim button like I do in my RV-8. But once I have the airplane trim, both airplanes are very, very responsive. And of course, this is a larger airplane, and I wouldn't expect it to be as, as quick uh, as, an, as an RV-8 uh, or, or other aerobatic airplane. But as far as, as being precise, I think that's the key word. It's as precise as that smaller airplane that I'm flying. This aircraft will redefine the large-scale movement of air travelers. In an all-economy configuration, the aircraft can carry over 800 passengers, almost double the capacity of a 747. But most carriers are choosing to instead make the aircraft more luxurious. Singapore Airlines now offers enclosed luxury suites featuring extra-wide reclining seats or full lay-down beds with turndown service. Now, if you could sum up the A380 in three words, what would those three words be? It's the future of air transportation. At the Aviators, we've showcased all sorts of different aircraft, from general aviation aircraft to the giant A380. Whether it be a J3 Cub or Boeing 747, all aircraft have one thing in common, they all need maintenance. However, instead of waiting for things to go wrong, regulatory bodies such as Transport Canada or the FAA stipulate that all aircraft are operated under a maintenance schedule. For smaller, general aviation aircraft, this is known as the annual inspection. Today we're at the Brampton Flying Club with Director of Maintenance, Angelo McConey. Angelo, I'm a pilot. My life depends on your work. Is this just a bunch of paperwork or is this a legitimate inspection? Annual inspections on aircraft are vital to the safety concerns of the pilots and the passengers. These air aircraft are maintained differently than a car. Uh, we don't have the option of pulling over if something goes wrong. So every year the airplane goes through uh, an opening of, of all inspection panels and all systems, every nut and bolts gets inspected and checked over. Now these in annual inspections are regulated by Transport Canada here in Canada. From a regulatory perspective, what's involved? How is it governed? Uh, Transport Canada, being the, the governing body, uh, operates through a series of regulations known as the Canadian Aviation Regulations. In those regulations, there are guidelines as to uh, what needs to happen, what needs to ins be inspected, and what needs to be certified. Along with that, the manufacturer of the aircraft also has inspection sheets that we follow um, while we're conducting the inspection. Now, getting your hands dirty, how deep do you really dig into this? We go into it uh, very deep. Uh, once again, you know, it's all about safety and uh, we cannot pull over uh, in the air. So we open and close every panel, every nut and bolts gets checked and uh, we get into it fairly, fairly in depth. When you take all the panels off and we're, when you're looking at the engine, what type of things are you looking for? Uh, inside an inspection panel, uh, there's pulleys, there's, uh, there's ribs, there's frames of the airframe that we inspect for cracks, uh, cables for the, for the flight controls get inspected for wear, uh, fraying, um, and that sort of thing. When you're doing an annual inspection, what type of snags do you typically find? On the average inspection? All components on an aircraft either have a calendar time or an hourly time which way they need to be either overhauled or replaced. Examples of that would be an alternator brush inspection, uh, engine hoses, brake hoses, wheel bearings need to be 
uh, cleaned and lubricated every so often, uh, that sort of thing. In your extensive career, talk about some more of the extremes. What have you found uh, in, in, during these inspections, some of the crazier snags? Uh, a lot of cracked cylinders, cracked landing gear actuators. We found engine control cables that are twisted uh, and not rigged correctly. And when you find these cracks and corrosion and so on, where, where do you refer for the limitations on how far that can get until replacement is required on these parts? Most cases, uh, it's through the aircraft maintenance manual. Uh, they will specify the limitations in there. Uh, a lot of it has to do with experience level. Um, and worst case scenario, there's, a, there's a, what they call a, a Bible, which is the AC4313. And that, that gives us limits as well. For the annual inspection, the aircraft comes into your hangar, you do the inspection. How long does that take, roughly? That would typically take about two days to go through the inspection portion of it. Uh, once that has been done, we notify the, the owner as to which snags that we, that we have found and get authorizations as to which, which snags we actually go ahead and repair. Depending on the nature of the snag, that will dictate how long the airplane uh, would remain in the hangar. Typically, it's about a 10-day turnaround on an annual inspection. So now the million dollar question. Everyone must be wondering, how much does this cost? So Angelo, on the Cessna 206, what's the final bill going to be like? Well, that always seems to put a smile on my face when I discuss this. Um, this particular airplane will be uh, $2,000 just for the inspection portion of it. The annual requirements will be about $200, and any authorized snags will be over and above that. Typically, this aircraft here, by the time it leaves the hangar, will be five to $6,000. Well, safety is priceless, and it's great to hear that we have aircraft mechanics such as Angelo keeping pilots, passengers, and the general public safe in the sky. Recently, the aviators went into a simulator to get step-by-step -step instruction on how to land an airliner. Our pilot was correspondent Jeff Lewis, who flies airliners for a living. This week, we return to the simulator to see if a private pilot can land a jetliner. The scenario is our pilots have become disabled, and someone noticed my aviator's hat and made an assumption. <laughs> I am a private pilot. I'm going to step into the controls, and I'm going to try and save 90-odd people. After getting myself settled, I managed to get a hold of air traffic control. Houston Center, Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. Aircraft uh, calling Houston, go ahead, say your identification. Uh, Houston, I'm a private pilot, and I'm at the controls of an airliner here. Our, our pilots have become disabled, and uh, Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> Roger, copy that. Can you identify the aircraft that you're on? Uh, we're at cruise autopilot, and I'm flying an Embraer right now, an Embraer 190. Okay, Roger, we copy, uh, show you 12 miles from the Innes intersection. That's giving you about 20 miles to Houston Airport. Okay, it looks like we've started our descent. Okay, well, it's, uh, just stay calm, you can do this. It's just like landing any other aircraft. We're showing your heading as 247. Do you see where that is? Yep, 247. Okay, uh, please turn the aircraft to the left, heading 160, and you can look on the glare shield uh, near where the altitude select was, it should say heading select. Okay, so I'll just uh, turn the heading select counterclockwise to 160? That's correct. Okay, here we go. Unlike any other plane I'm used to, I'm making all my heading and altitude changes on the aircraft's FCU panel and trusting the autopilot to do the rest. Now ATC is asking some questions that are making me a little nervous. Yeah. Roger, do you have any idea how many passengers are on board, sir? Uh, it looks like it's a full house, and I think it holds 94 or something like that. Okay, and um, if you could uh, just let us know uh, what happened up there. Uh, the pilots appear to be uh, out of commission right now. I, I think they might have had the fit. Okay, Roger, we copy. Um, just security pro protocol, uh, we're going to be scrambling two F-16s to come intercept you. Uh, they will remain clear. You don't have to worry about them, but it's uh, for security reasons. Well, now that I've made some new friends, ATC manages to guide me around, and I have the airport in sight. At this point, I'm informed that I will be manually flying the aircraft. Now the fun starts. Uh, we've cleared all the other traffic out of the way, and we copy you just going through 6,000 feet at 250 knots. Confirm that? Uh, coming through 6,000, 5,800 now, 250 knots. And if the field is at our 11 o'clock, I have it in sight. 
On your control yoke, you should see a red button. That red button will disable your autopilot. Okay, I'm using a push to talk on the panel right now. Is there a trigger or something on the yoke? Uh, there is, and it's uh, next to the electric trim, just above the autopilot disconnect. Okay, got it. So I recommend continue to send down to 3,000 feet, and I can hear your autopilot alarm going off. Please uh, click, double click the autopilot disconnect there. And that sounds a lot better. Roger did it. Yeah, altitude is now your discretion. You can enter a left-hand circuit, and I recommend you enter a left circuit for 33 right or left, uh, whatever runway your choice, the wind is out of the north. Okay, it looks like I'm on a heading of about 33 now, so that would be the runway that we're coming up to. I think we'll take 33 and we'll do the, uh, we'll do the left circuit. Roger. Altitude? Heading is your discretion. You are cleared to land on runway of your choice. I'm in good shape now. I can see the airport. I've made my left turns into the pattern. My flaps are set and the landing gear is down. Now I just have to land the plane. Okay, remember, this is a larger aircraft than you used to fly. You have to flare it a little higher. When you hear the voice call out 20, that's when you should flare the airplane and bring the thrust levers to idle and just plant the airplane onto the runway. Uh, Houston, how am I looking on your end? Okay, you're in good shape. Your speed's a little high, and we're showing you a little uh, below the slope. So just hold that altitude and still, until the, uh, the runway's a little bigger in your window. We're still showing you a little fast, but you're, doing, you're in good shape. You're doing a great job. Finally, I've hit the moment of truth. I've cleared the trees, and I'm ready to touch down. Can I do it? This is a simulator, but it'll behave exactly like the real thing. I've planned the approach in my head, and now I'm ready to carry it out. But I've never landed anything more than a single-engine Cessna. This airplane weighs 41 tons. All right, this is actually looking like a... Don't let your speed get back too low. No more less than what landing. you're doing now. Okay, you're short final, you're in great shape. Just put that airplane on the runway, and good luck. 30, 20, 10, 9, 8, we show you on the ground. Congratulations, you've landed the aircraft. Well done. Thanks very, very much, Houston. Well, we're down and uh, and we're safe. And, and you know, they say any landing you can walk away from is a, is a good one. And uh, I think I think this is a pretty good one, all things considered. When we were on short final, it's really strange because it did not feel or look dissimilar to what I'm used to landing on any, any runway in the 206. But we're down, we're safe, and, uh, and this private pilot just landed an airliner. <laughs> wow. Next week, we'll show you the final feature in the simulator. Can a non-pilot at the controls of an airliner land an airplane? Our cameraman, Devin Lund, takes his shot at trying to land the Embraer 190. I don't think the, there are any odds. I think it's 100% I'm gonna not land this aircraft. My name is Richard Cooper, and I fly the L-29 Delphin. Every child who has ever been to an air show or watched Top Gun has dreamed of owning or flying their own fighter jet. Private aerobatic pilot Richard Cooper took this dream to a new level. Not only did he buy his own jet, the L-29 Delphin, he now flies it in air shows. The aviator's cameras had a chance to join Richard on a recent flight. It's a beautiful aircraft to fly with a straight wing. It's very docile. I mean, actually getting out of the MiG, flying it sometimes, jumping into the Delphin is like flying, it seems like flying a 172, it really is. Uh, a lot of people will look at it and say, oh geez, a jet, that's gonna be very complex to fly, gonna be difficult, but actually it's not. The L-29, as far as jets go, is inexpensive with a base price tag ranging from as low as $16,000 to $65,000 US. But they're not cheap to maintain. The annual inspection alone can cost anywhere from $10,000 to $25,000. This is largely owing to the aircraft's origins as a Soviet-era fighter. They weren't concerned about the fact of the labor issue. They were happy to employ people, so they didn't look at something where they were going to actually have minimal types of man-hour maintenance. It's very simple, but it requires people to look at it. The L-29 was used up until about 10 years ago by a few forces around the world. It was designed as a advanced fighter trainer light ground support. So the aircraft can be outfitted with 
rockets or bombs. This current model has two drop tanks on it. It doesn't have a gun, but it can be used for light ground support, but it's quite extensively used for training. A lot of people would train in the L29 Delta and then move on up to a MiG-17 or 19 or MiG-21. Uh, the Russians have a very unique steering and braking system on the aircraft. It's pneumatic. So the aircraft has a, non, a non-in-flight replenishable nitrogen system. Basically, if you push the rudder pedal that you want to brake, and then you grab a lever and you pull it with your hand, and that applies air to the actual brake that you're pushing down on. So you'll see the airplane sometimes dipping and nosing like this, and both the MiG and the L-29 have the same braking system. Flying a high-performance jet does require an experienced pilot and a special endorsement. Richard received his in Delaware. There are several pilot centers around the U.S. that can provide L-29 endorsements. Well, basically, uh, the, to fly uh, this type of high-performance aircraft, you need a minimum of 1,000 hours fixed wing time before you can actually even get an endorsement on it. And then basically, it's a matter of just like flying any other aircraft. You go out, do the training on it, do the ground school, and uh, eventually go for a ride and, and uh, get an endorsement. So with the straight wing, it performs very, very well. Uh, it's an, a fairly easy aircraft to handle. It doesn't have a problem going slow because of the straight wing, so you can actually get it into the pattern, slow it down to 140. 140 knots is pretty slow for the airplane, but when you're coming into a small airport, you can do it at 140 knots and you don't feel unsafe. I mean, the aircraft is, you know, getting a little bit near the edge, but you can actually do it. Uh, the airplane performs pretty much everything really well. It'll do aileron rolls, it'll do barrel rolls, it'll do loops very, very well. The aircraft is a beautiful aircraft to fly and an excellent performer. As a former trainer aircraft, the L-29 gives Richard the unique opportunity of giving non-aviators the jet experience in the Delphin's second seat. Most of the time we end up doing airline rolls, that's about the most that people can end up taking without ever having a, a problem getting sick. Even then, a few of those uh, and people start feeling a little uneasy. If you're going out, I mean, I like going out and pulling some G's with the airplane because that always is a great way to show people like, the performance of it. You roll the airplane up into a 80 degree bank and start pulling on it and all of a sudden they feel themselves sinking into the seat and they can't move and they realize oh my gosh I'm powering around this corner at a, at a horrific rate that seems to be one of the things people really enjoy. G-force is the relative force experienced by an object as it's pulled towards the earth. During aerobatic maneuvers pilots can experience many times their own body weight. The force they experience is expressed as G's. Stressed for eight, the most we've ever done it is seven and a half. Uh, seven and a half times your body weight. So if you take your body weight multiplied by seven and a half, uh, you end up with a pretty big number. As you're pulling those G's, the, the blood is trying to rush out of your head. You're trying to force it back in. You're straining every single muscle in your body, working it, and uh, it does get very tiring. Well, this particular aircraft flies a lot quicker than the standard one, but we'll cruise along at 250 knots, but the aircraft will do 540 uh, miles an hour. Well, you're burning a lot of fuel when you're going that fast, there's no doubt about it. I mean, at that point, you've got the throttle pushed right up, but the, the fact is the aircraft will do it. This aircraft will go to the design limit of the aircraft, which is 0.7 Mach uh, in level flight. So if you push the throttle right forward, you can get it up to 0.7 Mach where the speed brakes will automatically deploy. The, the L-29 can burn up its entire 1,300 liter fuel load in about 120 minutes. Luckily, with this limited range, the L-29 has a fairly short runway requirement, allowing Richard to bring the aircraft into smaller airports. This particular aircraft for landing is, is very good. Uh, you can get this aircraft into a 3,500-foot runway. Uh, it comes in at a very, very slow speed in comparison to the MiG, so you can actually get it into shorter strips. 3,500 feet is not a difficult landing runway to get it in. 4,000 feet is very, very comfortable, but you can do 3,500. A very forgiving airplane, and it's a great entry-level jet. If anybody was thinking about moving into a, a jet, I would recommend the Delphin hands down. How's that? That was pretty cool. The Aviators, for everyone who has ever gazed skywards.